have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 30. That's where we'll be today. Isaiah chapter 30. That song, if you want to know the words to it, it's Psalm 67, part of Psalm 68, and, and part of, obviously, Philippians 4.4. 4. But I wanted to praise him. I wanted to glorify him. And I wanted to be able to exalt him in a song. So hallelujah. I want to preach a message to you today. It's just called God's Way or the Highway. God's Way or the Highway. Isaiah chapter 30, starting in verse 1. What sorrowful awaits my rebellious children, says the Lord. You make plans that are contrary to mine. You make alliances not directed at my spirit, by my spirit, thus pilling your sins. For without consulting me, you have gone down to Egypt for help. You have put your trust in Pharaoh's protection. You have tried and hid his shade. But by trusting in Pharaoh, you have been humiliated and humbled. And by depending on him, you will be disgraced. For though his power extends to Zion and his officials have arrived in Hanes, Still, all who trusted him will be ashamed. He will not help you. Instead, he will disgrace you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time to preach. Lord, this is your message. It's not mine. Lord, I just ask you that you would just flow through the pews of this chapel, Holy Spirit, and have your way with every man that's here. Lord, that you would move mightily in what we have today. May you have free course, be glorified, honored. Praise to the door. Amen. So the children of Israel at this particular time, they rebelled against God. They said, God, we don't need you anymore. We, instead of looking to God who they could see, they went to Egypt who they did know and have been known in the past. And they tried to make a covenant with Pharaoh, thinking that, you know what, Pharaoh's going to help them. Not realizing all the time, and sometimes some probably did, but they were just rebellious against God. And all they had to do was complain with God and say, God, I'm sorry that I rebelled against you. I'm sorry that I've done these things against you. And God would have taken them back. They would have been God's children. Everything would have been hunky-dory. But they decided within themselves that they didn't need God, that they wanted to stay in the rebellion that they were in, stay in the, what they were doing that was contrary to the word of God, contrary to God's ways, and to have a governor or a, a headship or a false god with a small g to be able to lead them and guide them into the things that they still wanted to do that were rebellious against God. It's so in order to do that, they looked to Egypt, who was at the height of rebellion, the height of idolatry, and they said, let's go to Egypt. Because if we go to Egypt, we could do what we want, we could say what we want, we could continue on with the things that we're doing, and we never have to come to a saving knowledge of God. We never have to surrender our lives back to God. We never have to repent for the rebellion that we have in our heart, but we can just continue to do the things that we're doing. And God says, you know what, if you just want to come back to me, if you just want to say, hey, I'm sorry, I said, that's all you would have had to say, and I would have took you back. But pride runs rampant in the human heart. And when a man's pride is there, he will do anything and everything he can not to surrender to God. And if he had walked with God and he runs away from God, as the prodigal did, he'll do everything in his power to run under his pride. And the last thing he will do, unless everything is taken away and removed, is to say, I've sinned against the holy God, and I need to return. Amen. And so here they were, in Egypt. here they were. God was about to do send the uh, Babylonian army in. He was about to be able to take them and they were about to go back into captivity because they would not, they would not come back to God. And God looks at the world and he's in control. He's sovereign. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He knows everything. He's in control of all things. And I'd rather have a God if I'm going to have a God, and I do have a God, as well as some of you, 
that controls everything, is in control of everything, holds all things together, created all things for his pleasure, the Bible says, and that's the God that I serve. And that's the God that I'm talking about today. The Bible says, and I say in chapter 40 and 15, some familiar words. There was a movie in the, I believe it was, eight, I think it was 1982, somewhere in there, called Chariots of Fire. And it was a wonderful true story based on a true story about a man named Eric Little, who was a Christian missionary, but he was an excellent runner. And England wanted him to run in the Olympics, but the Olympics that his race was in on Saturday was on a Sunday. And there was another Jewish man that was a good friend with him, Abramson, who had a race that was gonna run on Saturday. And so Abramson has a problem. Eric Little says, I'm not gonna violate the Sabbath. I'm not gonna violate and run on Sunday when it's against Christianity to work on that Sunday. To him, he took it very seriously. And, he, and England was giving him all sorts of pressure because he was the best runner they had. And they tried so hard to persuade him to give up on his walk with God and just say, you know what, God's okay with you just compromising and you running on a Sunday. He walked into a church and he preached these words from Isaiah chapter 40 and 15. They're words that echo through my head and I continue to think about them even today when I think about the Sabbath day. He says, no, for all nations of the world are a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than the dust of the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. As if it were a grain of sand. All the wood in Lebanon's forest and all the Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make God a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes they are counted for less than nothing. Mere emptiness and forth. And verse 18 says, To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? And he walked off after he preached this message. And the Lord gave him this idea to go to the Olympic Committee and to swap the races. The Saturday went for Sunday, the Sunday went for Saturday. And they did so, and he won his race. Among all of the Nazi Germany type of 1942, I want to say, that was like in that era there, or maybe 38, but in the midst of <coughs> Nazism, he won his race. And Abrahamson, who switched with him, on, ran on a Sunday, he won his race. I've set out that to say this, that Eric Little, this great missionary, this great runner, put it, to the, put it to the kingdoms of this world and said, my God is greater than the kingdoms of this world. My God is greater than anything that you could see on the face of this planet. And all that you are and all that you could do is all because God's allowed you to do it. He's given you a free will that you can either follow him on God's road, on God's way, or you could choose the highway and you could do it the way of the world. You have your options of which way you want to go. And God will freely allow you to do both. But he tells you there's a cost that comes when you're not following him. There's a cost that comes when you say to God, God, I'm not gonna follow your ways. I'm not gonna follow your word. I'm not gonna come to a saving knowledge of you. I'm just gonna continue to do my own thing. You can do that. And I did that for 33 years. But look what it costs you. Look what it costs you. And Israel was facing a time when they could have come back to the Lord. They could have just ended their rebellious ways, but they chose not. And for the hand few that did, they were saved. But the ones that did it, they were dragged. And even some of the good ones and some of the people that loved God were dragged into the time of Nebuchadnezzar himself for 70 years. And there they are. But I read this in Psalm 20 and 7. 
The Bible says some trusted chariots, some in horses, but we will trust in the Lord our God. We will trust in him. The world is unstable. The people that live in this world are unstable. Everything that's built in this world by the flesh is on shifting sand. There's no stability in a false idol. There's no for sure in the false idols. All there is in the false world and in the idolatry of people are just a hope and a dream that something is going to happen. But can I tell you of a man who lived that for 33 years, it rarely happens. You get all this excitement, you think all oh, this is going to happen, all oh, that's going to happen. And dream after dream after dream falls apart. Drug after drug after drug that you think that's going to make you, that it's going to be it for you. You find offers you nothing in the end. Whatever alcohol you have, whether it be Jack Daniels, Jim Bean, or any of those other names that you think is going to make you a better man, is only there to lie to you and cheat you out of what God has for you. And God has so much more. He could have did so much with Israel if they just would have said, God, we're sorry. God, let us turn from our wicked ways and repent. The Lord says this in Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of this earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in the heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king in Zion, my holy mountain. Jesus looks down, God looks down, the Holy Spirit looks down at the kingdoms of this world and the men who govern this world, and he laughs at them. They plot against them that they're going to do this to God. They're going to do that to God. I heard a story the other day of a guy that tried suing God, took him to court in Michigan. Just cracks me up. Good luck with that one. Can I tell you something? God is always right. Amen. And, and, when, you, and when you doubt and you don't know if God is right, God's always right. So he's always right. But men will plot in their rebellion. Leaders of this world will plot in rebellion against God, thinking that they don't need him, that they could do their own thing, that they have all of the intellect, all the knowledge, all of the good luck to be able to do all the things that they want to do in this world. And they don't need God for anything. They're just going to continue to do their own thing. And they shake their fist at God as if they're angry with him, as if that they don't need him anymore. Well, wait a minute, God created them. And God allowed them to be leaders of the world. And yet in their rebellion, they sight and they throw off God. And they shake their fist off of him. And God looks down at the puny ants of this earth. Those that claim to be leaders, those that claim to be somebodies of this world, he looks down upon them as ants and he just laughs at their shaking their fist if he could see it. At their ways of trying to get around him, their ways of rebellion against him, their ways of trying to do things by saying, we don't need you, God, we can do it all by ourselves. And so we know this. We know that God is able to do all things. We know that God is awesome in every single way. And we know that God is able to move mightily and bountifully in the hearts and affairs of people. And if we just turn our hearts to God, if we just say, God, we've just done these things and we're sorry, everything would have changed. So either there's the way of repentance, the narrow road, as it's called in Matthew, the narrow road that leads to life, that you could walk, that's God's way. Or you could walk on the wide road that the Bible says leads to destruction. And those two roads, you have the ability to walk. And you have the free will to choose which one you're going to walk.
But I tell you, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Amen. As for what I am going to do, I'm going to serve him. And no matter what happens to me between now and the time I'm either raptured or not or I'm taken home, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow his ways. And I'm going to drag Bunny and Janine and Mom with me. Because I just believe that God's going to work out the impossible uh, in the impossible. You know, that. can I tell you something about the narrow road? The narrow road that's talked about in the book of Matthew is narrow. But once you get on it, it's wider than any road that you could have taken on the wide road. Because once you choose Christ and you choose him into your life, there is an unlimited amount of God to be able to work mightily and bountifully in your life, to help you with gifts and talents that you don't even know you had, to open you up to things that you never thought possible, to have situations happen in your life you didn't even know were going to happen. And God can make the impossible possible. There's a song I just continue to love, and there's a song that I even preached on here. It's called Jesus I Believe. It was by a group called Big Daddy Weave. He says, even the impossible is God's reality. Even the impossible is God's reality. And in that, what he is saying, he's saying that whatever your situation now, guys, sitting at the 445, well, however you find yourself here, if you receive Christ into your life, that is the beginning of what God wants to do in your life. It's the beginning of what God wants to fill your life with. It's a turn from where you were and the way that you were going and not only erasing your sin and taking you, your sins as far as Jesus was, never to return no more, but it's a turnaround now with the Holy Spirit spirit within you, to resurrect the Christ lives within you, to change you, to mold you, and to empower you to be able to do things you never thought possible. Amen. And that's the beauty of having Christ. It is the beauty of saying to God and humbling yourself before him and saying, God, I have sinned. The prodigal son and what he talked about came back and he said, I'm sorry. And God was waiting for him as the father, prodigal father, just waiting on him with a robe. And they had this huge party. And you know what? God is waiting for you to be able to come to him, say any knowledge of him, and say, you know what? I'm sorry that I've done the things I've done. I, I, just, I just admit them to you. He already knows what you've done. He already knows what I've done. He already knows what Buddy's done. He's already known what we've done. He just wants to hear it from us. He wants to hear a heart that's no longer in rebellion and counting on itself or counting on another God, false God, like the Pharaoh of Egypt or even like the country of Egypt and saying, I'm turning around from that way. I'm not going that direction anymore. That's going to lead me to destruction. It's going to lead me to bankruptcy. And God had already said in his word here as he he talked about it in God's way. He says, but by trusting Pharaoh, you will be humiliated. By depending on him, you will be disgraced. And whatever God says is true. And I know what he said here was going to happen. All who trust in him will be ashamed. He will not help you. Instead, he will disgrace you. And he would, if he could, disgrace you. And God's grace and God's mercy is poured out upon a people that are rebellious. His grace and his mercy, as I did my song, are continually there for people to have the power and the strength to turn around from their wicked ways and say, God, I'm sorry. He empowers you to be able to do that when you ask him. Because in our pride, we can't lower ourselves to be humble. And so God, when you call out his name, will help you. And God will pour his life into yours. And you will see a transformation. Last month or the month before, can't remember what month it was, Buddy and I were here. We called out for decisions for Christ. And we had a young man, a wonderful young man come up to us and said he wanted to receive Jesus into his heart. He received Christ in front of us, and right in front of Buddy and I, Buddy could testify, we could see a transformation in this man's life right in front of us. 
we could see God changing him right in front of us. And we're just like putting it out and just like, wow. We've seen many of people come to Christ in, in all that we do, but this was like so special. And God wants to do that for you, for I. But you can choose God's way or the highway. You can choose to take God's way and let him lead you into what he has for you. Or you can roll the dice and say, you know what? I'm doing it by myself. I'm going to be my own God. If I have an idol or two in the way, that's okay too. But I'm relying upon that. Last Sunday morning, I went to preach at the juvenile prison up in Lincoln Hills. Some of you may know the place. And I was at the breakfast table at the, at the, at the hotel I was at, the Wausau, and I was having breakfast, and an elderly man came up to me. And everybody else in the restaurant, everybody else in the hotel that was eating all had Packer stuff on. And this older man walks in, and he comes up to me and he says, May the God of, may the God Jesus bless you, the God of Jerusalem, the God of Zion, may he bless you. And he walked away and he sat down. And I just like, wow, God just poured out a blessing upon me, an extra one that I needed. And I went to the prison that day and I preached and after my first message, I had 44 juvenile kids in service. A fight broke out, and a fight broke out right outside the chapel. And when that fight broke out, there were three boys that were involved in this fight. And I could see how God protected me from the fight because it was outside the chapel on the way back to their living units, and it was not in the chapel itself. And I praised God, and I praised God, and that's why I wrote the song that I sang. It's why I wrote that song. Because all I could do was praise him for my protection. All I could do is praise him for what he's done. And when you receive Jesus in your life and you let him work in your life, you too will see the benefits of what Christ can do. And if you don't have strengths, you know what? Let me tell you one thing before I close about strength. God's not interested in your strengths. Your strength doesn't impress him. Because your strength is something you could do without him just because you're gifted that way. But when you come to him with what you can't do, and you come to him in a humbleness, and you come to him with something you've never done before, something that you're totally relying on God to help you with, God gets in that and he helps. Not that God can't use your strength, but he's in it when you're weak. He's in it when you're humble, and he's in it when you can't do it on your own. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for the 445. Buddy, you can play something if you want. Play something. Hallelujah. The buddy's going to play something here too in my clothes. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for every man. Lord, we just thank you, Lord God, for coming into the service today to be a part of what we are doing. Lord, I pray for every man that's in this place right now. With heads closed, with heads bowed and eyes closed, there are men here today, you have never received Jesus in your heart. If you were to die today, stay before God, and say, why should I let you behind? You wouldn't know why, you wouldn't know what to say. And please don't tell them it's because of your good works, because that doesn't exist. So today I pray, if there's somebody within the sound of my voice, is there anyone with their heads bowed and eyes closed, raise their head, say, I'm not gonna call you up, but you're gonna say today I want Jesus. Anyone here today want to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation? Anyone here today want to know the great and mighty Savior? Is there anyone here today? If not, come up to us afterwards, we'll pray for you. If you have any need, come up to us and pray for you. 